today I'm laying out all the wiring for this car. I got tons of tons of things I got to put in this thing, and it's a little daunting, but I'm getting through it. It's it's all making sense. So right here we got the wiring harness. Yeah, I better clean this side. Okay, you go for it. I'm doing a good job. I got my helper cleaning my toolboxes, my boxo toolboxes. Make it, yeah, it looks good. That one looks good too. <laughs> so I got a wiring harness for the smart wire unit. There's two smart wire units, so there's two harnesses. The smart wire units are actually already mounted in the car. So there's one, there's two. This panel, once it gets mounted in the vehicle, communicates to the PDMs, the two modules that I just showed you. And that kind of controls a lot of the functions that I manually turn off and on. But then the ECU, which is a Holly EFI HP unit, which is right there, that makes some of the decisions as well. Like um, at what temperature the fans need to turn on, uh, when to give power to the nitrous solenoid, so all of those inputs also go to the PDMs and then the PDMs send an output to the nitrous solenoid, the fans, and so forth. Just going through all this stuff, I'm really excited that Holly has so many components under their umbrella, like Race Pack is actually a Holly brand, and also MSD is a Holly brand. So all these Deutsch connectors, and there's quite a few of them, honestly. So all of these, all these components are coming from Holly. Heck, even my fuel gauge that I'm using, all of it is from holly.com and they have been a huge, huge help in getting this car together. This is uh, making my life a lot easier. There's definitely a learning curve because the technology is so new to me, but it's overall gonna make things simple as soon as I learn all this stuff and how to make it work. We got all the wiring stuff out. And a bunch more just showed up with this guy. Hey, do you know the power and the ground go to get? Hey! <laughs> so Aaron's going to help me out with wiring this thing because he's super clean and super good. And he's done a lot of cars. And he has all, all these cool little things that you need for wiring. Aaron, you got so much stuff in here. And this is not all of it, I bet. Did you bring all the good stuff for my car? the best stuff <laughs> sweet so we're actually starting out from the back of the car from the power source itself we're starting from these two optima batteries we're gonna connect them together then we're gonna run the power wire forward and there's a lot of stuff that is gonna obviously connect to that so one thing at a time we're hooking up the batteries running them through a rear firewall and uh, we'll show you basically where we end up with that. What do you got going on there? So this is a hydraulic crimper. We use these for the power in the grounds to connect the terminals to actual wire. Um, it's better than just like hitting it with a hammer. Obviously we don't want to ever have to get in a position. I just hit it with the hammer. <laughs> get into a position where, you know, we can't figure out why the car is losing voltage or, you know. Um, I've definitely had those fail before. You know, obviously they weren't crimped with that hydraulic crimper. I've done it myself and the only thing holding it in after a while was the freaking shrink wrap, so it happens. Yeah, with these though, you can pretty much hang on them. They're like yeah, real strong, so. Sweet, sweet. Never have to touch them. Heck yeah. It's got all the gadgets. This little thing is just to cut the insulation off. It's like so many a, cool little tools. A good tip, a pro tip. Don't ever let uh, Matt Field touch any of your stuff because he likes to cut like steel braided stuff with your nice wiring stuff. Oh, then, I actually need to make some, uh, some no, fuel no, line. No, no, it's good. <laughs> just keep him away from stuff that means uh, a lot to you. Here's the Holly EFI HP engine harness. This is gonna have to go through my firewall. These are actually the connectors that go into the ECU. All the stuff goes to the engine sensors. Here's some loose wires that trigger uh, some accessories. Also, there's a switchable power for the ECU as well and a, a little ground. I gotta find a spot on the firewall and I'm thinking I'm not gonna go down the center because my engine's so far back. 
I'm actually gonna go on the driver's side because the driver's side cylinder head is recessed compared to the passenger side. So we're probably gonna go right about here in this nice flat area. And let me show you why I'm gonna punch it on the driver's side versus the center. And if you look at the way LS motors are configured, so here's a spare motor. This cylinder head is pretty much flush with the bell housing mating surface on the driver's side. You could tell the cylinder head is offset a little bit. So if we punch out the wiring harness to come out here, we get a little bit of space to work it in between the firewall and the cylinder head. Uh, I kind of like these Christmas trees over, or the step drills, <laughs> over like drills sometimes because you can repair your off hole. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You can like walk it yeah, somewhere. It's... <laughs> So this is this is where you could still turn back if it's off like an eighth of an inch. You could just like you could just force it in one direction. <laughs> and it eats that way. Yeah. And you're good. You got the hose out of the way, right? Yeah. I hope so. These are awesome. Yeah. Level up. Nice. Power ground. Yeah. That looks cool. Ready for the blow dryer? You don't even trust me holding it, huh? It gets really hot. It gets dropped. Oh, no, it's gonna melt the camera. So we got two uh, 20 amp outputs. The fuel pump might get near 20 amps and when the wire gets hot and it's kind of long, it, it might like build a resistance and definitely hit damn near close to maxing out that uh, 20 amp output. So we're gonna take two 20 amp outputs. So then the potential is 40 amps and uh, the PDMs from Race Pack allow us to do that. So we're definitely gonna do that, just keeping it safe. If we get really close to maxing out a certain output, we're gonna, we're gonna double it up to make sure that doesn't happen. So in order to do that, each 20 amp has obviously its own wire and then uh, we're gonna splice it together to a large wire. Here we got the uh, nitrous solenoid relay. It's a solid state relay. And I use a solid state relay there because if I wanna pulsate the nitrous solenoid, kind of like a fuel injector to slow down how much, um, if you slow down or speed it up, controls how much nitrous is being sprayed. Uh, now you don't have to just change jets physically. You could literally pulsate the solenoid and maybe if you have 150 shot going to the motor, which we have about 200 foot pounds of torque worth of nitrous that goes to the, my motor, maybe I don't want that to hit right away. So instead of just having the nitrous solenoid turn on, I have it start pulsating and then it, it pulsates faster and faster to where it's just staying on. And that kind of allows me to um, not just blow the tires off. You know, you want maybe some grip getting off the line and you don't want nitrous to shoot right away. So. Use a solid state relay because a regular relay, it can only uh, pulsate so fast. If it's being clicked on and off, it'll, it'll kill itself. Uh, other than that, I mean, here's a universal, kind of like a ECU adapter that allows the CAMBA signal from the Holly unit to communicate with our race back dash. And um, that dash is really cool because it not only shows you, you know, the outputs of the ECU, like engine temp, oil pressure, all that stuff. It's also a data logging dash. So I could data log every single run. There's a memory card that uh, fits right at the top of it. There's a slot for it right up there. And I could pull that memory card out and read logs. I really like instant information. So after any given run, I actually uh, sometimes will pull out my cell phone and I wanna see um, maybe how that last run was different than some of my previous runs, especially if we're trying different things on the car. I want to know if it got better or not. Sometimes just your butt dyno lies to you. Like, oh, the car felt faster, but in reality, it might've just been harder to drive. So it felt faster, but you might've been actually going slower. So in order to get like instant feedback, um, there's a mobile app that Race Pack has, and it comes with like one of their most basic telemetry units, the CL2 guy. Um, I love this thing. It works in street cars because it's got an OBD two port 
but we run that OBD2 port to a CAN bus and that picks up everything from here. Um, and also it has like built-in uh, like GPS speed uh, position on the track. So I literally could pick up my cell phone after a run and look at the track map and overlay like my speed, uh, how many like G's I'm pulling, look at the oil pressure, fuel pressure, look at my throttle position, uh, see if, you know, I feel like the car needs more speed there, but hey, my throttle position wasn't 100%, so I know it's not the car, it's me at that point, you know, things like that. I, I love instant data, instant feedback at this level. We need stuff like that in order to improve, you know, quickly. We can't just pound out lap after lap and uh, without trying, you know, anything new. We can't expect different results, right? So that CL2 race pack unit is a huge help. This is basically kind of all the circuitry that we're going to have in the car. It's all laid out. The pigtails are just kind of like hanging like spaghetti. It looks nasty, but I want to, you know, to share how things are laid out. Um, this is, I feel like, what you need in a pro Formula D car these days. And can't wait to loom all this stuff up, make it look nice and pretty, but yet keep it so it's very serviceable so we can unplug the harnesses and, and take stuff out and uh, put it back in quickly. Rob, you bugging my text or what? Dude, yeah, man, as much as I'm singing to him, <laughs> dude, keep him in done. high I'm spirits. Now. You gotta leave that dude. guy alone. He's rebuilding your shock. Dude, no I'm music in here, so I'm just bringing it in. So Rob Carlson was in here, who's uh, one of our customers, also one of our sponsored drivers. He was in here dropping off some shocks and fuel coilovers that he's had many, many years. And uh, I figured I want to show you what happens when someone drops off some coilovers that need to be re refreshed. So basically we take all the lower mounts, top mounts off and get down to the internals of the shock. John's building some, some new shocks here, That's but cool, guys, <laughs> yeah, but this is what they look like inside. Here's the shock body. We strip it down to where, um, we pull all the guts out. Here's the shaft. Here's the seal head. We call it. It's got O-rings on the outside. It's also got seals and some wear parts on the inside. So, on the inside of a seal head and here's one that john broke thanks for breaking this down john yeah no problem <laughs> so no, this is a broken down seal head and you can see this is down to raw metal and this is what we do this is a teflon line shock shaft bushing and this shock shaft bushing allows the hard chrome shaft to slide up and down without getting scarred up because obviously if it slid up and down through this steel seal head it would just get rashed up and wouldn't last very long so this is a really High quality shock shaft bushing. It's Teflon line once again. Underneath the Teflon though, there's a nice soft metal layer as well. So just in case you blow through this and you're not good about taking care of your coilovers, you don't rebuild them, this is not gonna get rashed up right away even if after the Teflon's gone, which takes many, many miles and hours to get through there. Here's a, an oil seal. And uh, we pride ourselves on having very low friction oil seals that work very well along with our bushings along with obviously really good machined and polished shock shaft uh, low friction in a shock is huge so when we rebuild them we you know use the same components that our brand new shocks come with you know here's some o-rings that go on the outside those get replaced as well once the shock shaft is out and we have the seal head torn off we spin it on the lathe polish it so that way if there's any like imperfections in it over time or any anything that nicked it over time we polish that out and also if it's bent um we visually see it once it's on the lathe if it looks like it's okay but maybe slightly bent well there's a protocol for that we put a dial indicator on it while it's spinning and we have our uh you know minimum tolerances if it doesn't meet that the shaft gets uh scrapped we put a new one on obviously same goes for shock bodies and any other parts if they're just not rebuildable then they get replaced like the internal uh, dividing pistons uh, some of the hardware seal heads themselves if loading new seals and bushings isn't enough shock bodies down there those just some of the common sizes or if you need to replace the entire cartridge itself anything you need we can handle it in-house very quickly we have the stuff to do it so rebuild your coilovers keep them fresh honest is working on some shocks here 
basically a cartridge gets assembled, oil poured, and then it gets pressurized with nitrogen. And we use nitrogen because if you just use regular air, as the shock heats up, it's gonna increase in pressure. Nitrogen is more stable when it's cold versus hot. Uh, it doesn't have like water particles, hydrogen in it. Um, so it's, it's gonna stay stable. So we use nitrogen so that the pressure is stable once it's you know, hot or cold. And then the lower mounts, springs, top mounts, uh, if needed, new bump stop gets installed. We replace the, the dust boot if needed as well. And the top mounts do have spherical bearings in them. They last a very long time. Let's say that you do need a new spherical bearing. We have all those in stock as well. Sometimes we replace just the bearing. Sometimes the whole bearing plate itself, which looks like this. And in order to get the bearing out, this is a threaded cap. It pulls out and the bearing itself comes out. What's cool about these, unlike some of the other brands, we don't use a C-clip on the bearing because what happens is if you beat the top mount by just driving rough or going over really rough terrain, the C-clip uh, seat gets kind of beat down and then the bearing starts to walk up and down just the tiniest little bit, but that will cause a knocking sound. So it's better to thread it down. That way the bearing always has a positive preload on it and there's no backlash there. And that means that the, there's not gonna be an increased amount of play that forms over time and time and time. So that's kind of the breakdown of putting, uh, getting a rebuild done on a fuel 441 coilover. And uh, when it's all back together, you know, top to bottom, looks like that. Ooh, what are you doing there, John? Just wrapping up the Civic kit. Yeah, stacking some shims. Nice. <laughs> we're gonna get into valving on another episode that's a whole different thing but that's when you take some of the internals of the shock apart and you play with them to make the shock stiffer softer more digressive less digressive all that fun stuff <laughs> <laughs>